Billy Lee Turner II is a distinguished American geographer, member of the National Academy of Sciences, and prominent among the third generation of the Berkeley School of Latin Americanist Geography. In August 2008, he took a position as the first Gilbert F. White Chair in Environment and Society at Arizona State University, where he was named a Regents Professor thereafter, the highest faculty honor that you can get at ASU. For most of his career, though, he taught at Clark University in Worcester, which has the best cultural geography program in the U.S. of A. Little known fact in this end of Massachusetts, but it's quite true. And there he served as Alice C. Higgins and Milton P. Professor of Environment and Society and was director of the Graduate School of Geography. To give you a flavor for um, his personality, he lists as one of his hobbies entertaining graduate students. So <laughs> this was very much in keeping with that. Uh, he's a highly entertaining friend and, and companion. So our speaker is the first son of Billy Lee Turner, a noted botanist who mentored the HMSC's very own uh, Diana Man Xochitl, where's Diana, um, for her master's degree. Uh, so that's a family name around here. He has a BA and MA in geography from UT Austin and received his PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1974 for work on ancient Maya agriculture, really pioneering work. At the time, uh, people didn't realize the degree to which the Maya participated in agricultural uh, intensification techniques. He focused on some agricultural terraces he discovered in the region of Rio Beck. That work and Billy's studies of Maya agricultural intensification caught the eye of Harvard's distinguished Maya archaeologist Gordon R. Willey, who invited Turner to come to Copan to do research on human ecology on his own project, the Copan Valley Sustaining Area Project from 1975 to 77. That is where he and I and Richard Leventhal, Gordon's field director on that project, and also the sponsor of the Gordon uh, R. Willie lecture series. So we always tip our hat to Richard for thinking of, of his alma mater on these events. That's where we first met Billy Lee Turner. His work was so compelling that he was asked by the director of the following government-sponsored project to do a complete environmental study and assessment of the valley and region. Turner's contributions to knowledge have evolved from his interest in human impacts on the natural world, a universally important topic. His early study was on the borders of archaeology and geography, sort of a, a, a border kind of person, fueling his interest in agricultural pathways and livelihoods more generally, particularly <laughs> agricultural intensification. As an authority on agricultural systems, he produced several influential texts on the theory of agrarian change. So this is big picture stuff. The environmental transformations that have accompanied population growth in Central America led to a broader engagement with cultural ecology and the human relationship with nature. A major initiative with colleagues at Clark University culminated in the volume he edited with Bill Clark and others, Earth Transformed by Human Action, published in 1990 uh, by Cambridge University Press, now a National Academy of Science, Science Classic. It was a major stock taking of anthropogenic impacts on the planet. Over the past 20 years, Turner has led or participated in other research on the science and dynamics of global environmental change. He's written or co-edited a dozen different books and countless articles and book chapters including the article that got me to thinking about him as the person that we should invite for this lecture. Uh, it was one that he co-authored with Jerry Sabloff, Gordon Willie's most distinguished former student, published in Science on the classic Maya Collapse and Climate Change. Turner's a member of the National Academy of Science, as I mentioned, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the American Association for the Advancement of Science and the Center for Advanced Behavioral Studies at Stanford. The list goes on and on. Many distinctions and honors over a very productive career. His interest in specific impacts of populations and societies on land use, 
change and alterations in land cover led to a return to fieldwork in Central America. Supported by several large research grants and working with a number of PhD students. Again, that graduate student theme, very important to him. The specific focus was to understand contemporary patterns of land use informed by social investigations and GIS and remote sensing. He's associated with the development of what's called LUCC analysis, land use cover change, and ways to assess it as concern grows about tropical deforestation and agricultural expansion. He's also promoted the emerging field of sustainability science, uh, which is a focus now at Arizona State University. I could go on all night, but I'd much rather, as I'm sure you would, hear what he has to say. So please give me a, a lot of warm welcome for our dear colleague and friend, Billy Lee Turner. Before I move on to the lecture, I do want to say something about this wonderful gentleman and wonderful scholar, Gardner Willie. Um, the last time I lectured at Harvard on the Maya was 1985, <clears throat> invited by Gordon uh, to come give a, a small lecture to the archaeology program. Um, but he ultimately was very uh, important in my career. As Bill pointed out, he asked me to join the Copan Project. Uh, as a graduate student, I had a paper that made it to science, and I know he was deeply involved in approving that uh, for that particular journal. When I came up for promotion and tenure, he wrote a very short two-paragraph uh, letter, but it was a terribly powerful. It was just people were sort of in awe of what, uh, um, and he subsequently did a lot of things that uh, helped my career uh, in multiple ways. I never had any sort of negative with uh, Gordon other than one. And it was in 1985, just before I was to give the lecture, that he invited me. This was a time period in which they were searching for his replacement. And as we were walking out of his office, he tapped me on the shoulder and he said, Billy, you can't take my place. And <laughs> <laughs> that was the, the end of that. <laughs> and therefore, we move on. All right, a little bit of something about myself, even though you heard. and I. I am a human environmental scientist, or I call myself a human environmental scientist. I work at the intersection between the social and the environmental. The problems are framed in terms of the social and environmental, and the way to proceed to the analysis is the interaction of the social and environmental. So what does that mean? Those people at the intersection often all right, are truly not uh, horribly in-depth in one or the other. And here I am talking about the Maya. I'm not a classical Mayanist, and I'm not a classical paleoenvironmentalist. And I'm going to try to bring those things together regardless. So what am I going to talk about? Well, I'm talking about the societal demise and depopulation that takes place in the Maya lowlands about 850 to 1,000 common era. Part of my title was Cautionary Tale. Why the Cautionary Tale? for those four reasons that you see there. Initially, and many people may not know this, the first explanation that I can come across for the collapse, often, I mean demise and depopulation, although from time to time I'll use the word collapse because that's what we've long called it, the collapse. Um, that one of the initial explanation was climate change. And then we went 70 years in which climate virtually was verboten when it came to assessments of, the cli of, of climate. And then the paleoenvironmentalist hit us over the head with, my God, look at what we found climatically. Right? But, as we'll learn from those people that do social environmental systems or sustainability science and whatnot, right, those kinds of interactions are invariably complex. And it's extremely difficult to pinpoint one forcing function uh, that creates the situation. So. That's the cautionary tale element. Now a little bit more about what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the uh, demise and depopulation in this area that you see in yellow. Um, I think it looks yellow anyway. All right, this is uh, what's often called the elevated interior or interior uplands of the Maya lowlands. It is an, a rolling karstic terrain reaching elevations about 350 meters max and typically with the uh, groundwater at 100 or 150 meters 
uh, below the surface. It was this area that before the demise and depopulation was the most densely settled and most landscape transformed area in the Maya lowlands. If we put up a map of all the big sites, you would see more clustered right in, the, in this region that I'm pointing out than anywhere else uh, in the Maya area. Once the demise takes place, the area is virtually abandoned and for quite some time, as we'll see. Uh, and you almost had a rewilding, rewilding in the sense that the forest comes back in, in, a, in, a, significant, in a significant way. So there's a shot of some of the la la new laser uh, data showing the density of population across these areas. And that whole population leaves for whatever reason, leaving us with this, what we called before a millennial long wave of population growth and decline. Now, why do I raise that with you? Because having one millennial long wave of population uh, ascendancy and decline for an area as large as we're looking at is rather unusual. It's very difficult around the world to find such situations. Invariably, you find two millennial long waves. In the case uh, of this area, we not only have just the one, even today, we haven't even begun to reach the level of density that the Maya uh, entertained before, before the demise. Now, the first explanation that we've had that inserted climate was 1912 by this gentleman, Ellsworth Huntington, Yale University. Uh, he went to Copan, he looked at the stratigraphy along the riverbank, and he concluded the following. The Maya entered the area when it was relatively dry, they rose to ascendancy during that period, then it got wet. When it got wet, disease vectors came through and wiped them out. And so this became the, if you would, initial, at least that I can find, cause of the mind, the climate, just the opposite of the climate we're talking about today, right? Okay, so um, he was part of a large body of luminaries who espoused the geographic factor which ultimately, determ uh, uh, ultimately the term we use is environmental determinism as opposed to the geographic factor. And I'm sorry, I'm at Harvard, so I'm going to say it. The father of that was William Morris Davis, a geologist, all right, who I guess was in this building or part of this building at one time in his life. He is considered the father of American geography, even though there's no geography program at Harvard today. You got it in geology, right? Uh, but the point is, he defined for the entire American system what geography was at the time, and that was the quote that you see below, the inorganic control over the organic. That is, how the biophysical world affects the social world. And that then gave rise to all these people that started looking at climatic uh, data around the world and rela relating it to uh, society in one way, one way or another. Well, for 70 years, uh, after Ellsworth made his proclamation, really based on minimal research, by the way, it was just I'm going to go observe stratigraphy in the Rio Copan River, climate or the geographic factor or environmental determinism becomes mute within the Maya understanding. I remember as a graduate student talking about environment in the Maya, and I was simply, oh, be quiet about that, right? You shouldn't, why? Because the, my mentors were afraid that if you raise climate, right, that would raise the notion of environmental determinism, right? We can begin to explain things in a way that we know is dangerous uh, in, one, in one way or another. Now understand, during those 70 years from the time um, uh, Ellsworth made his claim to the time I'm going to bring you to, we really had few integrated programs of field studies in the Maya area. Now, what do I mean by that? I don't mean that you had a great archeological project and there was a paleo-environmentalist associated with it or whatnot. I'm talking about projects who define themselves by the intersection between the social and the environmental world in which you have many, many people from both sides, uh, both archeological and paleo-ecological people working together on a defined problem in, uh, in the area. The programs that we did have that developed in those seven years, at least as we got into the 60s and 70s and whatnot, were really focused on how big the population was and what was the agricultural base that supported that population. That was sort of the integrated uh, uh, that comes to my mind. 
We also have to understand during this time period, we did not have the, the um, uh, strategies, the tools, the techniques, and methods that we have today to begin to address the paleoecological records. Nonetheless, there was data coming out by one individual here, one individual there, molluscan data, pollen analysis, uh, stratigraphy and whatnot, all suggesting that something had happened in this area. There was something environmental that went on, and that induced an argument about whether uh, this um, uh, change that we're looking at was meteorologically in, uh, uh, or a product of, of what the Maya had done. And then just before all the data comes, uh, comes in about climate, we have people elsewhere, in this case South America, finding significant climate change in certain of their records and then using teleconnections, the notion that if it's happened here, those processes, right, can go across the Caribbean, or is it Caribbean, whichever, I'm a Texan, we say Caribbean, uh, to uh, across the Gulf of Mexico and, and played in the, in the realm of the Maya. So that's where we were, right? The only thing you could show us was some teleconnections and then bam, the boom came in the 1990s. An explosion of paleoenvironmentalists invading the, uh, well, that sounds like they're bad people, invading the Maya lowland area anyway, uh, 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 doing their work. And there's two groups, there's many of them, all of them very good, but the two groups I really want to point out is the University of Florida team that really smashed us on the head with the work from Chichang Kanab that climate change was there and we better pay any attention to it. And more lately, the University of Texas team, husband wife team, that take the climate data, add to it paleogeomorphological and hydrological work uh, to grapple with the kinds of uh, landscape features that took place as the demise and depopulation was taking place. So what I'm gonna do in the first part is I'm gonna walk you through in my simplistic way um, the data that forced us to pay attention to climate. First, it takes place in the north, in the northern part of the Yucatan, uh, Lake Chichancana, Punta Laguna, and at a cave, Tico Cave, and then it's going to move south, and we're going to look at McCall Chasm, Yoka Balam, and Lake Salpatin. I'm not gonna go into great detail here, bear with me. But before we get to what they had to say, they were very honest, good paleoenvironmental researchers, and they pointed out to us the following. Although we're making the claim about climate, you must understand a few things. First of all, we're suspicious of the teleconnections because all of our work tells us the, the further the, the, the distance is in the teleconnection, right, maybe the least robust it is for the area you're trying to apply it to. Second, their argument was that their initial data really didn't have the fine temporal baseline that they needed. That had to be improved, right? You don't want to talk in, in, in hundreds of years, you want to talk in 10 years, five year time periods, right? Where you're dealing with these things. And third, that they're going to use proxies, but proxies don't always associate, you know, nice one-on-one -on -one with what happens to precipitation. And what we're going to find is through the, the early 90s and up through, uh, let's say, 2010, they're going to solve these problems, in my mind, uh, for the Maya region. So here we go, Lake Ch Chichang Kanab, what, 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 what did this uh, study do? It was looking at oxygen and um, hydrogen isotopes uh, in a core taken out of the bottom of the lake. And basically what it was showing is pronounced desiccation uh, in the climate uh, from the late classic uh, through to the early post-classic period. The TC down here stands for terminal classic, um, just in case uh, we don't know those terms. And what this work, you can just look at the lines, uh, the further they go up, uh, right, the more arid uh, the situation is. You can find these long time periods in uh, on uh, uh, half centuries and centuries in, in scale in which we get 41 to 54 percent of a decrease in precipitation. And this takes place, the two, the two big areas that take place are 750, 850, and 950, 1050 uh, common era. I'm not going to go into the uh, Punta Laguna work, but it sh basically shows the same thing. Massive drought in the north uh, during those time periods, but it's not fine tuned. Uh, in terms of the temporal dimension. And then along comes the work from Tico Cave. Now here we do have very fine-tuned dimension from a stalagmite. And you can look in the bottom graphic and you look at the gray zone and you see the eight different 
dry period interludes that take place. All right, so now we can get down to oh, estimates of down to three years, 18 years, 20 years, and whatnot in terms of when these interludes are taking place, how long they last. And in this particular case, the argument is the desiccation uh, ranged on the order of 36 to 52 percent of the uh, of the average normal rainfall for the area, and that it basically takes place from about 800 to 950 common era. I hope we're seeing that there's a general trend uh, developing uh, in these studies. This uh, study, by the way, did use oxygen isotopes. Well, that was the north. What about in the south? As some people argued, uh, maybe the south was different. Well, the work started to come out, and by and large, it seemed to show things that were very common to the north. Now here's a different study, a stalagmite from McCall Chasm, and here we're going to use luminescence. Uh, I'm certainly not an uh, expert on luminescence, uh, but what, lumine what the luminescence that you get in a stalagmite reflects organic acids that are released in soil and vegetation which are linked to precipitation. And therefore you can use this luminescence as a way to begin to grapple with uh, what's happening in the in the environment and what does it show and I marked it for you in the yellow from 750 to 1150 significant desiccation uh, of, of the region what I want you to keep an eye on because I'm going to come back to it later is there were significant drought interludes long before this demise and depopulation yes the ending one was quite large but we want to think about uh, how the Maya responded to those, those that occurred earlier. Two more studies from the south came up, Lake Salpetin and Yolk Balam Cave. And uh, the Lake um, Salpetin not only used the hydrogen and carbon isotopes that some of the other studies had used, but it used yet another proxy, and this proxy being leaf wax lipids. Especially, essentially, the wax on leaves basically can tell you something about precipitation uh, in, the, in the environment. Was it more moist, less moist, and whatnot? And what does it show? I'm sure this is the top graphic that we're looking at now. The two arrows are uh, designating this time period from the late classic through to the um, uh, post-classic period of significant desiccation uh, in the environment. And what you're looking at here is the green is coming from the south Lake Salpetin and the orange is the Lake Chichanganab. And what, what they're trying to show you in the graphic is that it was just as intense in the south as it was in the north, this desiccation period. The other, the other point that was trying to be made here, maybe I should use this uh, pointer. I'm not very good at using pointers. I don't think they look very good. Anyway, um, the other point was that for the south, it may have been a little bit moister than the north, right? When they hit that the, this extreme desiccation hit, but I'm not going to really uh, go through that in great detail. Well, the South didn't have fine-tuned temporal data. Well, y Yolk Balam Cave provided it because, again, now we have a, a stalagmite and we're working on it. I mean, people are working on it and they're getting fine-tuned temporal resolution that you see in the bottom uh, picture and you see the two arrows pinpointing this extreme uh, aridity that's going to take place between about 820 and 870, uh, in the, in, with the extreme case being uh, taking place in the terminal classic period. Well, uh, Cheryl Lazardus Beach uh, put this all together for us in this wonderful, in this wonderful graphic, and when she said, "Let me take all the data that we have from all the different sites and put it together, and let's see what it tells us." Well, what you see are seven large drought periods that take place. Uh, throughout a long uh, time period of, of Maya occupation from the pre-classic uh, into the historic, historic period. Pay no attention to the last two. That's historic. Uh, the, the, what's good about that, however, is that we actually have some documentation of people talking about how dry it was uh, during that time period. The, where I want you to pay attention is these two. These are the two big dry interludes that, are go that we're concerned with today because they are the ones that are going to be bandied about as a factor in the demise and depopulation of that elevated interior. The other thing I want you to keep an eye on is that dark um, orange or burnt orange line at the top is the South American uh, climate change. And I want you to look very carefully, you'll see that in its case, it not, does not show a consistent dry signal that's consistent with the Maya dry signal. In other words, 
the teleconnections doesn't work just as the paleo environmentalist, uh, or doesn't work as well as the paleo environmentalist were telling us. So summing all this up, we have this situation that we now have pretty good climatic data across the entire occupation of the elevated uplands, in fact, the entire Maya, uh, Maya area, not just the elevated uplands. And the three problems that I raised before have been solved, or largely solved, all right? We now have fine-grained fine temporal dating from the north and from the south, uh, giving us more or less the same signals uh, um, in that dating, uh, and, and, and it's linked to desiccation. Uh, that we have relatively consistent signals in all the data, uh, and we don't need the teleconnections to tell us anything. We have the data from the, the Maya region. And because we have a large number of different proxies and they're all giving us the same interpretation, it gives us confidence that, um, um, that this uh, desiccation was real. It was severe and real. So what we now have now, I would argue, is a pretty much consistent agreement among the community that drought evidence sinking with the demise and depopulation is pretty real. It was present. It needs to be accounted for. It may even be that we're at the point where we can look at the variation uh, in the kind of different Maya areas and Maya sites as it links to the specificity of the desiccation that's taking place. All right. Cautionary tale. We weren't going to say anything about climate. We couldn't avoid it now. All right. The paleoenvironmentalists have slapped us in the face and said, let's get to it. Okay. The question is, was climatic change, and I'm going to use the term climatic change to mean independent of whatever the Maya are doing. All right, this is something that's happening, let's say, at the global scale. Was it sufficient? Is it just sufficient to know that we had this uh, desiccation in the climate of the Maya area? And before I get into that, I want to pay attention to a great colleague, he just passed away recently, Carl Butzer. Uh, Carl Butzer did research from geology to geography to archaeology, right? I think he wrote a famous book called Archaeology as Cultural Ecology or something like that. Uh, very, very deep into it. Anyway, he paid a lot of attention to climates around, I mean, excuse me, to societies around the world and their response to various environmental uh, perturbations and degradations. And just read the one sentence. So, Social environmental dynamics and societal collapse are invariably complex, more indep involve independent variables, and are difficult to predict. All right, so this was his shot at all those people that want to say, okay, we had climate, um, we have to pay attention to climate, uh, and perhaps that's all we need to be uh, paying attention to. He also told us that in most cases he looked at around the world historically, you had more adaptation right, to whatever the big disturbance was from environment than you had uh, anything else. OK, so now let's take that understanding there's complexity and begin to ask a series of questions. The first one was, remember that graphic showing you past drought interludes in the Maya area? So we had significant past droughty uh, time periods. In each case, the Maya not over, only overcame them, what results is a larger population, right, and a materially more advanced um, uh, uh, social arrangement. Uh, I guess I'm not saying that right, right? The amount of the buildings they build become more, right? The, the, the things we think is monumental architecture grow and, and so forth. In other words, they respond, they adapt uh, to those uh, past changes. So now we have to begin to ask that particular question. The question then that raises is, well, why didn't they respond to the last one? To the, the, the two periods I'm showing you at the end in which we had this very, very severe uh, mega droughts taking place. And I suspect that they really did. And what we're going to find out is, yes, we're beginning to have insights that they did. But, and this is what Jeremy Sabloff and I were attempting to articulate, was there something peculiar about the social environmental system Right, that the Maya had created in their particular environment that made it different from the past. It made their environment all right, had become maybe too vulnerable, too big hazards affecting them, less resilient, or did their environment actually amplify and create the climate change? Right? All three of those uh, are, could, could be happened. 
could be happening, and it's that that um, I'm going to address now. What were the conditions at the end of the collapse period when this intense, um, an, uh, intense drought period came on? Well, the Maya had transformed the land. They had a huge population. I think we've all resolved that particular, uh, particular issue. I mean, we could argue over you know, what the actual density number was, but it was significant with sites all over the place. Uh, they were urban. Uh, in my sense of the term of what urban means. They had large populations, urbanized populations, and they had made fundamental changes in the entire landscape of the elevated frontier. They had denuded uh, much of the forest. They had agriculture growing across the up, up dry lands. They had huge areas of wetlands, and in these wetlands they had manipulated them as well. Uh, they had water reservoirs all over the place. They did have managed forests and I won't go into all of them, but essentially you had a landscape that looked a little bit more in my mind driving across Ohio than driving across uh, the Yucatan, the Yucatan today. What do we know now? We know with the new laser data coming out from Smith, uh, Carnegie, Smithsonian, and others, right, that that was right. That what we had in 1970 and called, some people called it anyway, the new orthodoxy of the Maya in terms of number of people and landscape changes and whatnot, the new data is showing that. It's just reifying what we already knew. Now, that's why I get a little bit aggravated when I see the New York Times put that up, that somehow the lasers have blown our mind. Well, they didn't blow my mind. You know, that's, that's what we had already said was taking place, and they're just demonstrating, in fact, uh, that it was probably true. And that even includes, in the second little graphic, the one that says B, uh, the, the the expansion of the amount of agricultural systems that we did not know specifically, like for this particular location, and the lasers are... So it's terribly important, don't get me wrong, uh, I just wish we wouldn't hype it so much, but maybe that's what sells the papers and the online reading and whatnot. All right, so the Maya had a highly intensive uh, uh, manicured landscape, providing them uh, food, fuel, and water. Um, our suggestion, Jerry and our suggestion is that this made them highly vulnerable and lowly resilient in a number of ways, which I'm going to articulate. But if you want to see it in detail, you can see that uh, particular graphic and all the arguments about it in uh, Proceedings of the National Academy uh, of Sciences in 2012. As the drought was taking place, we now, and this did follow, so here's good news from the laser scans, I'm going to say. It led us to a recognition uh, by uh, the, the uh, Texas duo that do this work that the Maya in the elevated interior moved slightly. I don't mean they moved location, but they shifted agriculture slightly to the wetlands a little bit lower in elevation from the elevated interior because these wetlands still had water. And that allowed them to use a system uh, that uh, is depicted, that's depicted in the, the picture. The issue here, though, is their work is suggesting it didn't last too long. And it probably didn't last too long, they think, because the desiccation was so severe, right, that even these wetlands didn't have sufficient water. And so the amount of food, uh, of food and uh, 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 whatnot that you wanted from the system wasn't persistent. Now, we don't know this for sure yet, but that seems to be where the Texas duo are going uh, in their ongoing work uh, in the area. All right, what did this landscape do, this transformed landscape? As global environmental change uh, came on board over the last 25 years, one of the works that, that has really been striking is the degree to which the meteorological and, and uh, uh, ecological community have demonstrated that if you change the land cover, the land surface of the earth in significant ways, it has forcings on the climate. I mean, you can think that's not too hard for anyone to think through. You know, you cut down a lot of trees and you don't have evapotranspiration anymore, at least in that uh, particular area. But what they were able to show is that Whatever's happening climatically that is independent of the current or the local area, <clears throat> that local area itself will have some interaction and feedback with the climate change that's going on. The work, nobody has actually attempted that work in the Maya area, but there are several models. 
that have attempted to say, could you get the level of desiccation that we're finding in all those studies I showed you if you only relied on climate change, natural climate change? And their answer is no. The only thing that would give it is if you had forcings from land-atmosphere interactions. In other words, the Maya had cut down so much of that vegetation and changed it in so many ways that they were amplifying the aridity that already was present, right? Things were getting drier. They were making things drier uh, um, uh, in tandem with the climate change that was ongoing. That modeling work, I think, is pretty good. We need more field work, however, to begin to assess it better. What else happened in this configuration that you see? Well, we had the uh, land forcing affecting the climate change. We, of course, had tremendous water difficulties that were going on. The Maya had built big reservoirs, all sorts of systems to feed water into the reservoirs and whatnot, and there was just an insufficient amount. What we have not paid enough attention to are the next three bullets you see, because they have a lot to do with food production. The critical limiting nutrient in the soils is phosphorus in this particular area. Where does the phosphorus come from? Well, one part of the phosphorus comes from capturing uh, phosphorus and dust in the atmosphere through the canopy. You cut the canopy, you've lost right, the ability to pull that phosphorus uh, out of the atmosphere uh, to the same degree than having some other kind of vegetation. Right? So that becomes a, a, a significant problem through time and would have been ascending all right, to its hardest scale at, at the time period we're talking about. It would have increased soil temperature and decreased soil moisture. Well, we know this. We have our field work that, that demonstrates this case. Again, affecting crop production. One that we haven't paid attention to in any of the archaeological work is that this is an area where you cut that forest and, and that bracken fern right, invades it instantly. Bracken fern is very thick, grows very rapidly, and is just essentially chokes out all other vegetation. Now the question becomes, how do the Maya deal with that? We don't know. How do they deal with it today? Today, Mayanists will just, I mean, Mayan people will just burn the bracken fern. But what does that do? That just makes it denser when it comes back again. So the question is, how did the Maya confront this constant problem of things getting drier, bracken fern is all over the place, you know, did they expend all the labor to actually pull it out? Maybe they had some technique we don't know, but it's something that people need to be paying attention to. And of course, what happened that they, they had done to the landscape, they had degraded their biomass for fuel. And, you know, there's all sorts of work coming out from Mayan sites now that show you had this much stuff, you know, you're using big timber, then less timber, and then we're using little trees that nobody else would use in the past uh, because they have denuded so much of that particular landscape. Okay, so they had transformed this landscape. That leads me to a series of critical questions. So here's the first critical question, right? Was the, trans the transformed state of this elevated interior interacting with climate change sufficient to generate a tipping point in the social environmental system. Okay, and that lens led, led to the demise and whatnot. Clearly, this transformed landscape and its interaction with climate was significant, but perhaps in, insufficient. Recall what Butzer keeps telling us about how com complex SES situations tend to be. Were there any options that the Maya could have entertained uh, to combat this drought? Well, we now know they were trying to expand wetland agriculture, but it seems to have been insufficient, uh, or insufficient given the desiccation that was taking place. But again, that's uh, another area of work that research still needs to uh, add. Or, and this is the third, uh, was the capacity to invest in mitigation strategies reduced. And this is where Jerry and I go off the board and um, say, yeah, we have increasing evidence that that's the case. And here's what it is. We know that when the elevated interior dominated the Maya area, they controlled trade crossing the peninsula, more or less this east-west arrow that you see. And if you want to know uh, how can it be, well, you actually can take rivers up to the elevated interior, cross it a bit, and then go down to more rivers and, and get to the other side. 
when the demise takes place, this is what happens. Right? We have big canoe trafficking going around the peninsula uh, instead of uh, across the peninsula. In fact, Christopher Columbus ran into one of these canoes on his way to Colum uh, uh, trying to go across to Columbus to, to do trading. The problem we have here is the chicken and egg issue, right? Did the Maya collapse and the collapse caused you know, the loss of one trade route and therefore they shifted to another? Or did uh, a shifting trade route or the beginning of a shifting trade route or the amount going in the, around the peninsula help trigger a loss of commerce uh, in, the, in, the, in the elevated interior and hence uh, precipitate part of the demise? We have a new theory out that said, oh, this area may have been uh, a big area for cultivation of cacao or chocolate, okay? Oh, wait a minute. I think I have a picture for you. There we go. Uh, of chocolate, right? You've, you've heard the famous dissertation, when money grew on trees, right? And this is when money grew on trees. Uh, and the argument here is that the drought was so intense that the uh, uh, control that the elevated interior had over cacao production was lost, right? Because the cacao production became too, too difficult. Once they lost that, they lost the trade a big part of their trade mechanism, uh, and then the uh, trade trading then circumvents the, um, the peninsula rather than going across. So there uh, now is a new major challenge, I would argue, and that challenge is we have to improve our spatial uh, and temporal dynamics of Maya trades and trade routes. Can we handle that in some way so that we can get a notion of, you know, were these simultaneous, the drought and the shifting trade? Did one come first? Did one come after? Uh, to me, that's, that's a big problem that needs to be considered. And people are addressing it in very inventive ways. So here's a study that came out recently. That's the study there on the bottom in, uh, that says EG network analysis. A network analysis of trading in parts of, uh, uh, parts of the Maya area. And what this study basically says in the trade network analysis is that trading was going across the peninsula and then shifted and started going around the peninsula, right? But the point I'm trying to show you this is that no one in my time would ever use a social network analysis to do a study of the Maya. And now we have all these very inventive ways that people are beginning to uh, address the problem. So what Jerry and I basically offered in 2012 was the notion that some combination of commerce and severe drought, which included the landscape transformation that the Maya made uh, interacting with climatic drought, may, just may have been the complex mechanism uh, that created distress on the system and led to a tipping point. And when this tipping point came, uh, basically it was just much more efficient to get up and move maybe to the littoral along the coast. Uh, there you did have water. The uh, groundwater was much closer, much closer to the surface and you had trade flowing around the peninsula. But it did lead to a depopulation and demise of the elevated interior. Now, there is another part of the story because the environmental subsystem returns. The social subsystem never does. Now, I'm not trying to offend people who tell me, yeah, there were Maya that were, yes, there were. But the level of the, the, the density uh, just wasn't there. The material uh, uh, achievements simply were not there. So about a 80 to 120 years or so, the forest comes back. The soil reco recovers as much as up to a 280 years afterwards. These are pretty good soils uh, for the tropical region. Nobody invades it and takes it over again. Remember that millennial one lay uh, in population. Now, there was minimal re resettlement, but it was minimal. And I, call every, I recall everybody the words of Bernal Diaz. Bernal Diaz was with Cortez when Cortez, for some reason, decided he would march from Mexico City to Honduras. Can you imagine that? From Mexico City to Honduras to quell an uprising in Honduras. And they marched right through the elevated interior. And Bernal talks about they're hacking their way through the forest because there aren't trails. They almost die from a lack of food because they can't find villages to force them to feed them. And it wasn't until they stumble out on Lake Pitinitza and there's Tayasalas there and they get food and water, et cetera, et cetera, they can advance on and make it to Honduras. So what I'm trying to, yeah, there were Mayan there, but they were very minimal compared to what was. So the question becomes, that environment returned, the people didn't. A very interesting question. 
So the question, another issue to raise is why haven't people, why didn't early on the Maya and even today uh, move into this, this area? And I'm showing you pictures here only to show you that there's so much forest still there today, right, that it becomes part of the Maya Biosphere Reserve and, and whatnot. In, in case you don't know, the one factor that's changing the landscape there a lot now is narco deforestation. And it's a very, very significant problem. Anyway, was the problem that we never had sufficient land pressures along the littoral, that people never had to go back in big numbers into the interior? We don't know. The one that always I kind of like is the notion that the investment to go back into the interior was too large. Right? You had a pretty nice living along the coast. You had a nice standard of living. You were going to have to invest a lot of money to have the same if you were going to move back into the interior. There was too much infrastructure that had to be uh, re reconstructed. Or were there some unknown environmental or social factors at work? We just don't know. I've heard rumors through the talking grapevines that there is a study out there that says there was a change in the seasonality of precipitation. Hadn't been published yet, right? It's only been rumored at one talk that I've heard, so I can't speak to whether or not that isn't one of these issues that we need to be paying attention to. I'm sure we'll learn about that in the near future. So the next major challenge, I would argue, is we have to improve our understanding of why people didn't go back into the elevated interior in any numbers. And if we can answer that or improve our understanding of it, we may begin to have better insights about uh, the collapse in general. Okay, I'm almost done. Here's the key element. We did have a depopulation and a material demise of the elevated interior. In fact, I call that elevated interior in some articles the heartland. I'm the heartland because it had the most people in it in, in, anyway. So, we know that took place. We know that there was severe long-term climatic drought and it was real, right? But we have some, sufficient, uh, some suspicion that that climate drought alone was likely insufficient to bring down uh, the elevated interior. But we also know that they had an enormously transformed line, uh, uh, landscape, very high cost to maintain it because the infrastructure was so large and it too had environmental impacts uh, beyond those that I'm going to talk about in a moment, and that those two link together to amplify the drought, right? uh, plus all the other problems that are going on in this uh, transformed landscape. Then on top of that, if you've lost the trade, if you've lost the commerce, I don't know if it's uh, cacao, I don't know if, what else it was, but you've lost that commerce going across, and now it's going around the peninsula, that then leads to that. And that's the argument that, sort of the argument, although I've, I've, uh, uh, I've added on to it, that, that we made in 2012, and that it seems to me the evidence has not um, uh, overturned in any, in any significant way to date, although some people will argue about X, Y, and Z. I want to thank all these kinds of people that have helped me through the years. I want to thank those four archaeological projects you see there that I worked on in my first 20, 25 years. Uh, uh, the, the last project at the end was a social environmental systems project that gave us a lot of insights about the phosphorus and whatnot that, that I just uh, 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 gave to you. And I'll end with something because I like to embarrass people. And so I thought this would embarrass Bill, but then I saw him for the first time in 25 years and he looked just like he did when we were at Copan in 1977. This is Richard Leventhal, who was also a Willie student. Uh, I think he's at the University of Pennsylvania now. Anyway, I hope that was uh, comprehensible, and thank you.